Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Today we pick up our study in Job chapter 34, verse 33. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Picking it up right where we left off. Elihu, one of Job's uh, yeah, th friends, I guess you would say, he is talking about Job. He's talking about Job's three friends, and he's not happy with any of them. And he goes on and he says in verse 33, Should it be according to thy mind, he will recompense it, whether thou refuse or whether thou choose, and not I. Therefore speak what thou knowest. In other words, a person may not want to live God's way, and that's their business. We all have a free will. But they should not think that God will lower his standards and okay their lifestyle. I mean, you want to live contrary to the word of God, that's your business, go ahead. But don't expect God to overlook it and say, well, that's okay, because he won't. Verse 34, let men of understanding tell me, and let a wise man hearken unto me. Normal people, those who have had their head, those who have their head on straight, is what he's talking about here. He says, let men of understanding tell me, let wise men hearken unto me. I want to listen to those kind of people, and I want the approval of those kind of people. Verse 35, Job has spoken without knowledge, and his words were without wisdom. A number of people were saying that Job was full of nonsense. So if Job won the approval of people who had their heads screwed on straight, he wasn't getting it, at least as far as Eliphaz was concerned. He's, he wasn't getting it. Verse 36, My desire is that Job may be tried unto the end because of his answers for wicked men. They're saying, Job, you've been saying terrible things about God, and you deserve severe punishment for it. Verse 37, for he addeth rebellion unto his sin. He clappeth his hands among us and multiplieth his words against God. In other words, people were saying, Job, you have trouble because of your sin, which was not the case, but that's what people were saying. And then they went on to saying, you've made matters worse by not submitting to God's discipline in the middle of it. Well, there may be some truth to that. God continues to discipline until we learn our lessons, but uh, these people are, are constantly misjudging mis, uh, uh, poor Job. Verse 35, Elihu spoke moreover and said, Thinkest thou this to be right, that thou saidest my righteousness is more than God's, and I don't think Job ever came right out and said that. Maybe he did. I don't remember, but he sure has implied it. I mean, Eliphaz is right about that. I say, I mean, Elihu. Job said that he was perfectly innocent before God in reference to the suffering that he was going through. So he was, I suppose, implying pretty strongly that if he was perfectly innocent, then he was suffering wrongly at the hands of God, which means that he was more innocent than God. And Elihu is saying, do you think it's smart to say that, Job? And Elihu is right on target here. It is not smart. You never want to charge God with wrongdoing, no matter what you don't understand about what's happening. Verse 3, For thou saidest, What advantage will it be unto thee? And what profit shall I have if I be cleansed from my sin? Job also said it doesn't matter if I sinned or not. It doesn't matter if I'm living right or not living right. And, you know, it does matter if you're talking about being punished for sins. It doesn't matter all that much if you're just talking about trying to avoid trouble in this world because good things happen to good people and bad people and bad things happen to bad people and good people. Verse 4, I will answer thee, and thy companions with thee. 
Elihu is determined to show that neither Job nor his three friends knew what they were talking about. And you know what? He was, he was right about that. Problem is, Elihu didn't know what he was talking about either. You're going to have to wait for God to speak at the end of this book, and he'll straighten things out. You know, people, people talk back and forth. They all have their ideas. This is what I don't like about Bible studies that are just buzz sessions, where you got a group of Christians sitting around on a Wednesday night or a Thursday night. What do you think this means? What do you think this means? And on and on it goes, and they're all sharing their ignorance. Just find somebody who is going to study the Word of God and teach the Word of God verse by verse. And let's hear what God thinks. That's the important thing. So he goes on to verse 5. Look unto the heavens and see, and behold the clouds which are higher than thou. If thou sinnest, what doest thou against him? Or if thy transgressions be multiplied, what dost thou unto him? And then he says in verse 7, If thou be righteous, what givest thou him? Or what receiveth he of thine hand? In other words, God's not dependent on you, Job, for his happiness. You're not going to ruin his day by living in sin. You're not going to make his day by, by being a righteous person. Verse 8. Thy wickedness may hurt a man as thou art, and thy righteousness may profit the son of man. In other words, you can ruin your family's day with your sin. I mean, you can mess up their lives with your sin. But you're not going to ruin God's days. Verse 9. You know, and that's true. Some people say, I'm going to show God I'll go to hell. I won't repent. So there. Well, you're a fool. You're not going to ruin God's day. You're not going to ruin your saved husband's day. You're not going to ruin your saved wife's day. You're not going to ruin your saved children's day. And if you're a child who says that, you're not going to, you're not going to ruin your parents' day throughout all eternity by you going to hell. If you want to do that, you just go ahead because the rest of us are going to know that God is perfectly just sending you there and you are getting exactly what you want. If you think we're going to shed a tear for you, you're crazy. You, we won't shed a tear for you, no matter how much we may love you in this life, and neither will God. You're only hurting yourself. Verse 9. By reason of the multitude of oppressions, they make the oppressed to cry. They cry out by reason of the arm of the mighty. When, when times are hard, people cry out for relief. A lot of people do that. They beg God for help. Verse 10. But none saith, where, where is God my maker, who giveth songs in the night? See, unfortunately, many of those same people who cry out in desperation when things are going horribly, many of those people do not think about God very much when everything is going well for them. Verse 11. Who teacheth us more than the beasts of the earth, and maketh us wiser than the fowls of heaven? God uses his creation to teach men wisdom. The birds and the animals don't learn from us, but we learn from them. We learn a lot from, from nature, you know that? I mean, I've heard that uh, a helicopter was designed by studying the dragonfly. I've heard that, uh, uh, you know, airplanes are designed because of studying birds. So... God uses his creation to teach. It's how, it's how we can tap into nature and tap into creation and learn some things and invent some things that will enhance our life. Verse 12. There they cry, but none giveth answer because of the pride of evil men. In other words, if people ignore God until they are in big trouble, he may ignore them when they cry out for help. Verse 13. Surely God will not hear vanity, neither will the Almighty regard it. When a, when a person who doesn't care at all about God cries out to God when he's in trouble, all it is is panic. And God knows that person's heart. As soon as the trouble subsides, he's going to turn away from God again. And this is true repentance. And if there isn't, God's not going to respond. He may ease up because he's full of love. He may ease up the trouble a little bit because he's full of love. 
But I mean, God's not stupid. He knows if a person means business or not. Verse 14. Although thou sayest thou shalt not see him, yet judgment is before him. Therefore trust thou in him. Job had said that, that he was sick and tired of waiting for God to answer him, answer all his complaints, change his situation, explain to him why he was going through all this trouble. And of course, Job was overlooking one important thing, and that's that God doesn't have to answer a person who has an attitude like that. Verse 15, But now, because it is not so, he hath visited in his anger, yet he knoweth it not in his great extremity. Therefore doth Job open his mouth in vain. He multiplieth words without knowledge. He's saying, Job, all you do is talk stupid. That's all you do. You talk stupid. And anyone who accuses, anyone who accuse, accuses God of not doing his job is talking stupid. And that's what Job was guilty of doing. You accuse God of not being fair. You accuse God of not being a righteous God or some such thing like that. You're just stupid. Chapter 36. Elihu also proceeded and said, Elihu is determined. He's going to defend God some more. Look at verse 2 and 3. Suffer me a little, and I will show thee that I, that I have yet to speak on God's behalf. I will fetch my knowledge from afar and will ascribe righteousness to my maker. So he's defending God. And he says, everything I know about what's right, I've learned from God, my maker. And, you know, you can start there. You want to you blame God for the bad things that are in your life? Well, you can't because bad is a result of sin. But what you should do is thank God for the good things that you have enjoyed in this life because he's responsible for that. All the every good and every perfect gift the Bible says come down from comes down from the father of lights from God. Verse 4. For truly my words shall not be false. He that is perfect in knowledge is with thee. In other words, I know what I'm saying is the truth. It is so good. That's one thing I love about the word of God because when I teach it and I proclaim it, I know that what I'm saying is truth. I never have to say, I think. When I teach the Word of God or read the Word of God, I never have to say, after I'm done, I think. Perhaps that's true. I never have to. I know it's true. It's truth. Verse 5. Here he goes. Behold, God is mighty and despiseth not any. He is mighty in strength and wisdom. God is powerful but he doesn't push innocent people around. He, he's not a bully. He's powerful. He can do anything, but he's perfectly righteous. And he's also kind, and he's also generous and gentle. Notice verse 6. He preserves not the life of the wicked, but gives right to the poor. And that's the other side of God. He punishes the wicked. And he also defends their victims. Verse 7, he withdraweth not his eyes from the righteous, but with kings are they on the throne. Yea, he doth establish them forever, and they are exalted. God watches over the righteous, and sooner or later, and sometimes, maybe most of the time it's later, he will promote them. He will lift them up, and he will bless them. Don't give up on God simply because that hasn't happened yet. Remember, God is eternal. He's got all eternity, and so do you, to enjoy what the rewards of righteousness. And God is just. He's not going to fail to give you those things. So if you want to be a part of this ministry, you can be. Your prayers and financial support are greatly appreciated, and you can, you can donate to Scripture verse by verse by using PayPal, and you can do that at our website, which is thebibleversebyverse.com. That's the BibleVerseByVerse.com. And go there, and as long as you're there, study the whole Bible with me from Genesis through Revelation using my audio Bible commentaries. Again, that's the BibleVerseByVerse.com. Until next time, so long, everyone.